Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Library and most of all to the uh, Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, the present workshop is actually a culmination of the work of a special research group hosted this year by the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies under the title Interrupting Kafka, Laboratory for Scholarship and Artistic Creativity. And it is the first time that the Institute hosts a research group that is combined of both scholars and artists. Many eyebrows uh, were raised when the choice was made, and many challenges were presented by the group itself. But I do hope that the Institute managed to deal successfully with most of the challenges, and that the group had a fruitful and enriching time under the auspices of the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, as many of you probably know, I am not an expert on Kafka, nor am I a theater scholar. I'm merely an historian of the early Middle Ages. Um, so I cannot comment on Kafka and his work. You will probably hear more about it in the, in the papers that uh, will come. All I can contribute is a small historical comment and tell you that Kafka's work is invariably imbued with medieval themes and literary techniques, especially those taken from the medieval grail narratives. His heroes are often the naive foreigners who do not understand the customs of the land. Um, just like uh, Parsifal of Chrétien de Troyes or Sir Gawain of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. This is not at all surprising when one keeps in mind the fact that the grail circles of medieval literature enjoyed a vast circulation and popularity at the turn of the 19th century. And Wagner's operatic interpretation of these themes were constantly staged at the time in Central and Eastern Europe. Moreover, Kafka's favorite author, Soren Kierkegaard, was also a close reader and adapter of medieval literature. So although Max Broad reported that Kafka once told him that he could not um, tell the difference between the Merry Widows and Tristan and Isolde, I would rather understand that statement as a sarcastic comment made by Kafka and misunderstood by Max Brod, who had no sense of humor whatsoever. <laughs> so I think I'll stop here and wish you all a fruitful conference, and we'll see you at the Institute at a later stage. Thank you very much. Ready? Professor Emeritus in the Department of Theatre at Tel Aviv University. Where he was the Dean of the Faculty of the Arts. And held the Emmanuel Herzogovic Chair for 19th and 20th century art. art. He is currently a visiting professor of Theatre and Performance Studies at the University of Chicago. Chicago. He is the author of Philosophers and Thespians Thinking Performance, and the prize-winning Performing, performing history, history, Theatrical Representations of the Past in Contemporary Theater. Both have appeared in several translations. He is also, also practicing, practicing dramaturg. Ready, roll, okay. Thank you for that surprise. The, the text I knew, but I have never seen the performance before. <laughs> Not even when I look at myself in the mirror. Yeah. So uh, before I uh, want to thank uh, Itzik Hen. Itzik, where are you now? Okay. Who is the director of the uh, Israel Institute of Advanced Studies uh, and all the others. I want to present you with a box of matches. The can. אדוני, אתה יכול לראות את הספרייה הלאומית שלנו. Here you can see our national library. Here, in this direction. 
Where? The tourist asks. Here. Is that the National Library? The tourist asks. The, yeah, yeah. The, the, the National Library, the driver says. Zohia Sifriahalumit, is this the National Library? This was the opening of Hanoch Levin's uh, sketch about the National Library in 1969 uh, in the performance called The Queen of the Tub, which really opened up the idea of interruption in the middle of the word itself. And since we are in this object called the Sifria Lumit, the National Library, I thought I wanted to show you what it really looks like. You may think you know what it looks like from the inside or the outside, but this is the National Library. And Hanoch Levin is important for some of the things I want to say, but first uh, I want to, uh, on behalf of my co-convener, Ruth Kanner, uh, and myself, I want to extend our thanks, the thanks of the Interruptions Research Group to all of those who made, have made it possible for us to be here today. First, we want to thank Michal Linyal, the former director of the Institute, who encouraged Ruth and myself to apply for residency at the Institute. And after the approval, and you heard that there were eyebrows raised, right? It's an interruption somehow already taking place. We were welcomed by the present director, Itzik Hen, who opened this conference, and the team of administrators headed by Iris Avivi, standing in the corner. We want to thank Efrat Shvili, Anat Yagil, Inbal Gizam Deutsch, Batya Matlub, Smadar Bergman, Mikhail Musonov, and Yossi Asulin, and maybe more people who we didn't catch in our net for uh, generously supporting our project, helped us to solve logistical issues, complex issues of bringing people back and forth between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and most of all, really most of all, for enabling us to explore interruptions and to develop our ideas. We also want to thank the people from the National Library, and especially Stefan Litt, who introduced us to the new Kafka materials, which were deposited here a few months ago, including the beautiful drawing of Kafka that you can see on the poster, which has never before been seen publicly. It was in the last deposit of, of the uh, Kafka estate or the broad estate. And together with him, Yara Levy and Doron Levine for giving us an opportunity, I've heard, tomorrow to see some of those materials exhibited for the first time. I will also begin by saying a few words in general who we are. Besides my co-convener, uh, we have, together with my co-convener, we have gathered a research group a kind of open laboratory consisting of six professional actors, four of which are members of the Ruth Conner Theater, which has just celebrated its 20th anniversary, and two younger actors in the beginning of their careers, one of them setting out to write a PhD in philosophy, two postdoctoral researchers from the Hebrew University Buber Society of Fellows, who besides being young, accomplished academics, also have practical theater experience, Two distinguished researchers, thinkers, who basically have academic backgrounds. And at the moment, we have three guest researchers uh, who have both theory and practice, two of which have come especially for this conference. Our group also includes a research assistant. She's very important for us. Uh, you see sitting there, Adi Chavin, the only one I will name by name right now, uh, who has just uh, completed her MA degree in theater studies and an administrative uh, theater director. And for this conference, we have also added, uh, invited some additional colleagues whose company and expertise we feel we can profit from. You will meet all of them in different constellations during this conference. Our aim, has been to create a safe space for everybody with as little hierarchy as possible where each of us possesses particular forms of knowledge which we can all profit from. So why do we need a provocation like this one? 
if it is also harmonious and serene, and what are interruptions? Can the unexpected really be planned? In which sense does it come as a surprise, a disturbance, or even a disruption? We have explored interruptions assuming that artistic creativity, in our case, the art of the theater, based on the transformation of a human body into a work of art through acting, has developed modes of planned interruptions, of accidents which can become meaningful in a larger context, or, as is often the case in the writings of Kafka, who has had a certain central position in our Oh, the pinch does not want to, uh, in our deliberations and creative efforts to show how senseless such an effort to find coherence is. Besides Kafka, our research has been based on the writings of Walter Benjamin and the artistic practices of Bertolt Brecht. Together, they are a triangulation of different modes of creativity at a time of crisis during the first half of the 20th century. And at the same time, we have also constantly drawn from the experience of the actors in the group, searching for ways in which academic and creative paths intersect. We have also been deeply aware that today we are urgently, we also urgently need artists and thinkers in order to create the conditions enabling us, as Hannah Arendt, Arendt has expressed it, to stop and think. For Arendt, it was the thoughtlessness of deeds of evil that literally disturbed her most of her all. And she uses the word disturbed, so it's not my word. Making her recall the Eichmann trial as she was beginning to write the life of the mind which remained unfinished at her death. I'll quote a short passage from the opening of this book. It was this absence of thinking which is so ordinary an experience in our everyday life where we, hardly, where we have hardly the time, let alone the inclination, to stop and think, that awakened my interest. Is evil doing, the sins of omission, as well as the sins of commission, possible in default of not just base motives, as the law calls them, but of any motives, whatever? Is wickedness, however we may define it, this being determined to prove a villain, not a necessary condition for evil doing? Might the problem of good and evil, our faculty for telling right from wrong, be connected with our faculty of thought? Could the activity of thinking as such, the habit of examining whatever happens, come to, to pass or to attract attention, regardless of results and specific content? Could this activity be among the conditions that make men abstain from evil doing or even actually condition them against it? So I think that the aesthetic questions in Aaron's footsteps are closely connected to moral issues, and we must remember that. So in order to activate this process of thinking, we first need to stop, to be interrupted. And this could be one of the tasks of the theater to create an interruption which makes it possible to think morally. So there is a complicated and uh, interesting development from the notion of the caesura to the notion of interruption. It happens from Hölderlin, who uh, thinks of uh, the caesura as a device or feature which structures the form of the work of art, or as he suggested in his remarks on Oedipus, gives form to representation itself. And beginning with the essay about Hölderlin and his literary caesura, Walter Benjamin transformed this notion of the representation into a theatrical performative idiom, gradually leading to his theoretical reflections on the epic theater of Bertolt Brecht. His insights of interruption feature uh, Brecht's epic theater, and its aim, which Benjamin maintained, consists in arousing astonishment rather than empathy by presenting uh, or representing conditions rather than by developing a continuity of individual actions based on causality. So it is in this interruptive process of creating representations that we have uh, focused our energies in trying to understand how uh, the performing arts and theater in particular 
uh, is a, a, a form of interruption. So it, it is an uncovering of conditions, Benjamin writes, and the, the, the very crude example that he gives, he calls it crude himself, the very basic example that he gives is of a, <coughs> a family row. There, everybody has a family and everybody knows what a family row is. The mother, Benjamin writes, is just about to pick up a pillow, and I'm quoting the first version uh, of the essay, because in the second and the third it is a statue, a bro eine bronze, uh, not a wooden statue, but a bronze statue, a, a metal statue, to pick up a pillow to hurl at the daughter. The father is opening a window to call a policeman. At this moment, a stranger appears at the door. Tableau, as they used to say around 1900. In other words, the stranger is suddenly confronted with certain conditions, rumpled bedclothes, open window, a devastated interior. In general, a scene of violence. And he creates a standstill. Stop and think. Uh, so uh, the question which I think is, for me at least, the most important one is who is this stranger? And uh, uh, Benjamin, in the first version of the of the essay, talks about uh, uh, the stranger from uh, Brecht's Versuche, a Schwabian Utis, a counterpart of Ulysses, the Greek nobody who visits one-eyed Polyphenus in his cave. Similarly, that's the name of the coiner, that's the stranger's name, penetrates into the cave of the one-eyed monster whose name is class society. Like Ulysses, he is full of guile, accustomed to suffering, much traveled, both men are wise, a practical resignation which has always shunned utopian idealism makes Ulysses think only of returning home. His name, Herr Koiner, may perhaps represent his character traits. It is, Benjamin reminds us in different contexts, it has two etymologies. First, as he suggested in a radio talk about Benjamin uh, from the year before he, he wrote the essay, which was not published in his lifetime, the name Koiner is based on the Greek root koinos, the universal, uh, that which concerns all, belonging to all. And in fact, Herr Koiner is the man who concerns all, belongs to all, for it, he is the leader, but in a quite different sense from the one we usually understand by the word. He is in no way a public speaker, a demagogue, nor is he a show-off or a strongman. His main preoccupation lie light years ahead from what people nowadays understand to be those of a leader. The fact is that Herr Koiner is a thinker. Uh, and uh, Benjamin also quotes one of the examples of uh, Brecht's uh, stories about Koiner. Uh, he, he writes, uh, Koiner never leaves the threshold of his house at all. He likes the trees which he sees in the yard when he comes out of his fourth floor tenement flat. Why don't you ever go into the woods, ask his friends, if you like trees so much? Did I not tell you, replies our coiner, like, that I like the trees in my yard? To move this thinking man, her coiner, who Brecht once suggested should be carried on stage lying down, so little is he drawn thither, to move him into existence upon the stage. That is the aim of this new theater, to bring the thinker on to the stage. And uh, both etymologists that B Benjamin quotes make Koiner a thinking man, a philosopher, as the, uh, the stranger a thinking man, a philosopher as well as an anarchist and a nobody. It is also no coincidence that Herr Koiner is frequently also referred to as Herr K. Franz Kafka's novel, The Trial, which was published posthumously in 1925, begins with the appearance of a stranger who announces that Josef K., as he is called at first, then also simply named K., eh, who is waiting to have his breakfast brought to him, has been arrested. Brecht had no doubt read Kafka's novel many times because his personal copy, kept in the Brecht archives eh, in Berlin, is literally falling apart and he has marked his ownership of this copy by signing his own name on the front cover between the name of the author and the title. So uh, here 
Brecht and Kafka and Benjamin are triangulated in a very complex constellation which it is not easy to open up, but it is a Gordian knot which I think is at the heart of our uh, project. Uh, so the question is, who is this stranger? And what does the stranger do on the stage? And we're all strangers in one sense or another. Uh, and uh, the, probably the, the most holy of scriptures in uh, the literary dramatic tradition, Hamlet by Shakespeare, uh, also talks about a stranger. And I think it, it, it does this in a very uh, important uh, context. It is after the ghost has left, calling to Hamlet, remember me, uh, Hamlet goes to meet his friends, and uh, he is asked to swear by they're, they're asked to swear on the sword by the ghost under the in the cellarage underneath the ground, and it moves back and forth. It's here and everywhere, as Hamlet says. Swear, says the ghost, and Hamlet answers, "Well said, old mole. Canst work in the earth so fast." A, a line which has caused both uh, Hegel and uh, Marx to misquote uh, uh, Hamlet in interesting ways, which I won't go into here. A worthy pioneer, once more remove good friends. Horatio, O oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange, Hamlet. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. So. This is wondrous strange, and then to draw the conclusion, therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. And then come the more famous lines. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So philosophy is the dream that comes after the encounter with that which is wondrous strange, which therefore should be greeted as a stranger. So let's welcome strangers. Thank you. I'm going to begin by introducing Vivian Liska, my friend, there. Although we tend to fight which is why they put us up first. <laughs> We're going to each talk a little bit about this past Auf der Galerie, on the balcony. I have the pleasure of introducing Vivian. Vivian Liska is professor of German literature and director of the Institute of Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. She's also a distinguished visiting professor in the Faculty of the Humanities at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has published extensively on literary theory, German modernism, and German Jewish authors and thinkers. Her Kafka-related books include a really great book, one of the few great books on Kafka, When Kafka Says We, Uncommon Communities in German Jewish Literature, and German Jewish Thought and its Afterlife, A Tenuous Legacy in 2017. Thank you for agreeing to be in this ring with me. Um, we start by reading the story. Yes. Um, we will start reading the story, and then um, each one give you an idea of our reading, then confront our respective readings with each other, and uh, invite you to join. Okay. No, she, she'll introduce okay. me before my... Oh, I can do this right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or not, my friend. <laughs> For now. <laughs> he teaches literature and critical theory at Yale University. His book, The Problem of Distraction, show that not thinking is a gift we give away much too easily. Also <laughs> <Our song> pretends. <laughs> His absolutely marvelous book on Franz Kafka's critique of faith, being, death, and art called The Yield, 
try. <laughs> I read that somewhere. <laughs> Past tense. Try it. Because now you've succeeded or because now you stop trying. <laughs> this is part of our discussion. Can you just read that? <laughs> <laughs> With corrections. Tries. No. Teaches people how in every situation to give up and give in. This was just a warning to me, putting me in my place. Give up and give in. You wish. <laughs> a new book answers the trivial question, what makes one thing like another? It is called Bizarre Privileged Items in the Universe, The Logic of Likeness, and will come out with some books in 2020. Okay, let's go on and read that. Do you want to read the German? Or we will read the German out. You can follow along because both of us will be paying very careful attention to the text. We will run it through your consciousnesses in German and then run it through your consciousnesses in English. I don't think we have a Hebrew, actually. We didn't think of that, but apologies for that. Is this a question? Because you said, let us. Uh -huh. But I. How did you call that? Give up and give in. Okay. So, thanks for letting us. Auf der Galerie. Wenn irgendeine hinfällige, lungensüchtige Kunstreiterin in der Manege auf schwankendem Pferd vor einem unermüdlichen Publikum vom peitschen schwingenden, erbarmungslosen Schäf monatelang ohne Unterbrechung im Kreise rundum getrieben würde, auf dem Pferd schwirrend, Küsse werfend, in der Taille sich wiegen, und wenn dieses Spiel unter dem nicht aussetzenden Brausen des Orchesters, unter Ventilatoren in die immerfort weiter sich öffnende graue Zukunft sich fortsetzte, begleitet vom vergehenden und neu anschwellenden Beifallsklatschen der Hände, die eigentlich Dampfhämmer sind, vielleicht Eilte dann ein junger Galeriebesucher die lange Treppe durch alle Ränge hinab, stürzte in die Manege, rief das Halt durch die Fanfaren des immer sich anpassenden Orchesters. Da es aber nicht so ist, eine schöne Dame weiß und rot hereinfliegt zwischen den Vorhängen, welche die stolzen, livrierten Feuer öffnen, der Direktor hingebungsvoll ihre Augen suchend ihn Tierhaltung ihr entgegenatmet, vorsorglich sie auf den Apfelschimmel hebt, als wäre sie seine über alles geliebte Enkelin, die sich auf gefährlichen Pfad begibt, sich nicht entschließen kann, das Peitschenzeichen zu geben, schließlich in Selbstüberwindung es knallend gibt, neben dem Pferd, der mit offenem Munde einherläuft, die Sprünge der Reiterin scharfen Blickes verfolgt, ihre Kunstfertigkeit kaum begreifen kann, mit englischen Ausrufen zu warnen versucht, die reifenhaltigen Reitknechte wütend zu peinlichster Achtsamkeit ermahnt, vor dem großen Salto Mortale, das Orchester mit aufgehobenen Händen beschwört es möge schweigen, schließlich die Kleine vom zitternden Pferde hebt, auf beide Backen küsst und keine Huldigung des Publikums für die Hühner erachtet, während sie selbst von ihm gestützt hoch auf den Fußspitzen vom Staub und Weg mit ausgebreiteten Armen zurückgelehnten Köpfchen ihr Glück mit dem ganzen Zirkus teilen will. Da dies so ist, legt der Galeriebesucher das Gesicht auf die Brüstung und im Schlussmarsch, wie in einem schweren Traum versinken, weint er, ohne es zu wissen. I think we both have some quibbles with this translation, but I'll read it up in the gallery. If some frail tubercular lady circus rider were to be driven in circles around and around the arena for months and months without interruption, in front of a tireless public on a swaying horse by a merciless whip-wielding master of ceremonies, spinning on the horse, throwing kisses and swaying at the waist, and if this performance amid the incessant roar of the orchestra and the ventilators 
were to continue into the ever-expanding gray future, accompanied by applause, which died down and then swelled up again from hands which were really steam hammers, perhaps then a young visitor to the gallery might rush down the long staircase through all the levels, burst into the ring and cry, halt, through the fanfares of the constantly adjusting orchestra. But since things are not like that, since a beautiful woman in white and red flies in through curtains which proud men in livery open in front of her, since the director, devotedly seeking her eyes, breathes in her direction, behaving like an animal, and as a precaution lifts her up on the dapple gray horse as if she were his granddaughter, the one he loved more than anything else, as she starts a dangerous journey, but he cannot decide to give the signal with his whip, and finally, controlling himself, gives it a crack, runs right beside the horse with his, horse with his mouth open, follows the rider's leaps with a sharp gaze, hardly capable of comprehending her skill, tries to warn her by calling out in English, furiously castigating the grooms holding the hoops, telling them to pay the most scrupulous attention and begs the orchestra with upraised hands to be quiet before the great jump. Finally lifts the small woman down from the trembling horse, kisses her on both cheeks, considers no public tribute <coughs> adequate while she herself, leaning on him, high on the tips of her toes, with dust swirling around her, arms outstretched and head thrown back, wants to share her luck with the entire circus, since this is how things are. The visitor to the gallery puts his face on the railing and sinking <coughs> into the final march, as if into a difficult dream, weeps, <coughs> realizing. I wish I could start quibbling with you right away and with this translation, but I would have to do it as we go height. We entitled our presentation, discussion, performance, halt, because it is not only, as you heard, a quote from this text, but is, we believe, a succinct manifestation of what we've been talking about in our group for several months. It raises many of the questions we have discussed, questions relating to what Freddy, in his wonderful introduction, uh, has called thinking morally, and when he spoke about the tension between empathy and astonishment. And uh, I believe that we will develop this tension between us. So, Halt, uh, strong expression of interrupting, in the sense in which we talked about it, particularly in relation to Verfremdung, estrangement, as suggested by Brecht, Benjamin, as a kind of Stillstand, of a freezing of a situation of time, end of that moment when a stranger comes in and halts the violence that you have uh, read in your introduction and with which we started out. So there's a scene of potential violence, there's a stranger comes in and halts the violence, or at least does potential. Because we haven't yet decided in our group whether interrupting is putting an end to, or whether it is just a moment of Stillstand and things go on. This will be relevant for, for what will be discussed here. We have talked about interruption in many ways. One of the ways that came up again and again was the sense that interruption can save, just as in the situation the mother would have hurled the bronze on the daughter, but there is a saving interruption with the stranger that walks in. I will try to discuss the halt in this Kafka story in terms of such an interruption, a saving one, unless, of course, someone will come and interrupt me, either <laughs> someone else, <coughs> in the best case, because one of the ways in which we have discussed interruption is the way in which the interruption by another 
stops, at least momentarily, our inner monologue and engages us in a conversation. So, I believe that my reading has a literary, a political, and an existential meaning. Very briefly, the literary one consisting in the fact that we are invited by a text as in an encounter with a stranger. And when we yield to this invitation, we find ourselves interrupted in our habitual ways of thinking, of living, of being. In the next step, what we're trying to do is domesticate this situation in which we are somewhat losing control of our the a control that we have through our habitual way of thinking. And we are thereby superimposing <coughs> on what we are reading or experiencing in the encounter with the performance <coughs> with art. We are superimposing our own habitual modes in order to integrate the strangeness to which we have been invited. We are thereby also undoing the actual interruption that is caused by the stranger. In the best case, if this is what happens, there is a little residue of unsettlement that remains. In a better case, this unsettlement remains. In an even better case, we are aware of what we've done and possibly can go elsewhere. I will try to show how this works here. Now, of course, this moment in which we are invited to see things differently from our habitual way has political ramifications, moral ramifications, and existential <laughs> ones. What are the conditions? The conditions are that there is something that calls out to us to intervene. To intervene just as the situation of the spectator up in the gallery is <coughs> challenged into intervening. Before I uh, briefly try to give you my interpretation of the story. I want to read out a few quotes that you have on your handouts and that are, I believe, highly relevant to understand the story. I will only read them in the English. And you see where they come from, and I do this you know, without saying where. The traveler wanted to intervene, possibly bring the whole situation to a halt. But, and that people were strolling in the vicinity and gladly intervene if they found a possibility for it, but they don't find one. I start my investigation, but I don't succeed in finding the spot where one should intervene. Possibly, thanks to my special experiences, I could usefully intervene in these matters, but I don't dare mix in. The true world could have intervened, determined the borough, changed it according to each wish, inverted it into its opposite, but where has it disappeared to? Unfortunately, <coughs> I do carry the worries, but for reasons that lie mostly in me, I cannot intervene. And the final one that closes a sequence describing a dream ends on Saved through the intervention of these men, I wake You may have noticed that just as often as the word intervene, eingreifen came up in these quotes, the word but <laughs> came up. To our story. The story consists of two contrasting, almost symmetrical paragraphs which resemble each other in each of its components. The cast, the scenery, the action, the effect. Yet, differ from each other in grammar, in rhythm, in color, in atmosphere, and above all, in its ending. 
in their endings. The scene is a circus performance with a lady writer, a director, a public, an orchestra, and a spectator up on the gallery. Being on the gallery is a specific place. There are cheap places in the circus, mostly for young men, here in this performance of the circus writer. The first paragraph describes a nightmarish scene in which the rider in distress is being driven ceaselessly around the ring by the whip-cracking ringmaster to the roar of the crowd, the orchestra, and even the ventilators who all come together in what is depicted almost as a kind of machine, as a perpetual motion machine. The first scene describes a torturous situation in which a poor, sick, helpless artist, oppressed by the director, is suffering on and on without end, without an end in sight, and as we are both told literally, can sense the constant you, uh, both, both, we are both told literally, and the sensation of it is given to us through the participant present, used as adverbs, giving a sense of a continuing state rather than an action that is finished. Bear the sentence, you may have noticed this when I read it, makes you breathless and, and you know, gives you a kind of identification with the artist in an increased urgency and in that situation, maybe the spectator is running down into the ring and saying, halt. There is a kind of potential revolutionary stop. But the first scene is kept in a subjunctive form, presented as a hypothetical situation, if it were like that. This first paragraph, with all its gruesomeness, is actually one long conditional sentence. The condition is not realized, da es aber nicht so ist. But it is not like that. But because it is not like that, and then we get the second paragraph, where the suffering uh, writer is a beautiful, confident artist, instead of the cruel, tyrannical ringmaster, we now see a doting grandfather who is, uh, you know, instead of lustfully swinging his whip, he, can, he has to overcome himself to do this. The rhythm also is very different than in the first paragraph. Instead of that long sentence where you get restless, there are at least semicolons that are giving you some pause the whole situation seems to be in a kind of much more harmonious situation. There is something grand and graceful. And unlike the first paragraph, that ends on a causality. If it were like this, then, and that makes sense. If it were this distressful, dismal situation, then the young man would run down. But the second paragraph, that is described in this, you know, beautiful, harmonious way, ends in a sentence that does not make this sense. It ends on the situation where the uh, spectator up on the gallery is putting his hand on the rail and is weeping without knowing. There is something that clearly is an estrangement of our expectations. Another estrangement is the question, what is the perspective from which we look at this? Are we with the spectator? Are we with the director? There are moments when we think we're with the spectator. The whole first scene is described like that. The last sentence is, he's crying without knowing it. So it cannot be his perspective that we are taking here. Also in the second paragraph, and I could, I'm not going into the details, the uh, artist is called the Kleine, the little one. Here we seem to be with the director. And of course, giving us at the same time a sense of the very patronizing way in which he is doting on her. Yet. This is clearly a change in perspective. 
and the perspective of the one who tells us at the end that the spectator up on the gallery <coughs> is crying without knowing it must be an omniscient narrator. Nobody can even see him because he's having his face on the rail. So, this stranger that comes to me from the text, this estrangement, is inviting me to make sense of it. And I'm trying to. And this is how I make sense of it in the awareness that there may be the problem that I described at the very beginning, that of making sense uh, is in a way of domesticating the stranger and integrating it into my very system. But I do believe that one has to go through this stage. So how do I read this incongruity, especially of the ending? There are the two basic incongruities are that in the first part, it is if the world were so terrible, then there could be a revolution. But since things are beautiful, <laughs> he's crying. So the two strange things are <coughs> that I would expect that the world is so terrible and it would require <coughs> revolution. But how come that this is in the subjunctive and the second paragraph is in the indicative? One of the striking details is that in the first paragraph, it is a circus rider and it is a spectator. In the second paragraph, it is the spectator and the rider. Now, there's an exception. It is the director in the beginning and in the end. But I leave this for you. I, um, why is it a and then the? That means that when we read the second paragraph, we have already read the first. That's how it works. First you say a, and then the refers to the one before. Could it be that the first paragraph with the description of this terrible, nightmarish scene and of the oppressed creature in the first paragraph is being, in the second paragraph, repressed into a subjunctive. So we would still be with the spectator saying, oh, I would run down there if this were like that, but actually, it's all fine. The world's okay, the director is nice, the artist is <laughs> in all her grace and glory, and therefore, I don't have to run down. And why the last sentence? Because the repressed returns with the vengeance of a weeping. And there is something that remains. There would then be an analogy between the way we paint over the dismal reality that we see with a beautiful image so that we don't have to run down. The story was first uh, published in the Lande Arzt, which originally was meant to be called Verantwortung, Responsibility. Wow. Now, an um, afterthought, maybe, yeah. I want to give you a few hints in the second part <coughs> of what suggests that this is being done here, that the second one projects a beautiful reality onto the terrible one as, so as to blind us to you know, to the terrible world in which we would have to intervene. <coughs> in the second, there are some elements that aren't there in the first, for example, curtains. So the beautiful woman comes through the curtains, which suggests that there is something that is, you know, behind the scene. That there is one reality that's being played out in front and another one in the back. 
uh, this idea of the curtain also happens uh, in the word Apfelschimmel, which is the designation of a horse. It's a, certain, it's a white horse with black dots. But right after, in the sentence, there are the word eyes, the director's eyes. Uh, one, in the situation of the director, one can read something like, you know, he's telling her that she's the apple of his eye. And Apfelschimmel is also, uh, you know, uh, a kind of, so Schimmel is, um, what do you say? Uh, mm, mm, mold. But it's also, uh, it's, a, it's a sickness of the eyes when you see as through a curtain. So it's the, it's the shimmer of the eye that is suggested in the sentence. So that, that there is this idea of blinding oneself and of putting a curtain in front of the actual reality. But there is an afterthought, and I am there now. What I have been doing here is setting the story right in order to integrate it into my system, into my expectations of a kind of message that is being given to us relating to responsibility, relating to, you know, an empathy with the, with the oppressed creature. Have I done justice uh, to the stranger or have I done precisely what the spectator is doing by <laughs> smoothing out a disturbing stranger. What did they say on Monty Python? And now for something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with you and with Freddie that if more than any, I think, other set of texts, Kafka's texts make you stop. I think that's true. And they probably call a stop not just to readers, but to literature and to philosophy and law. That's really their role, to call a stop. And they do that. And you can, you can imagine a kind of um, revolutionary thinking in this revolutionary reading that would have to stop and say, well, am I making things better or am I making things worse? Where are my projections here in the story? It's very easy to project onto a Kafka story. They seem to be a series of projections, and here you have two. Two projections of, let's say, the same story. Let's say that. What I'm going to ask you to do is to suspend the story and to hold back from judgment about what happened, particularly to resist answering the questions, what's the story? Who is this artist? And how does she do what she does? Or even, what is it that she does? Just suspend it. I'm going to ask you to look at the story from Auf der Galerie, from On the Balcony. And I don't think this is what Kafka means, but what I do is take these as a moment to think things that haven't really been thought. Um, I, I think that's what he's doing in a way um, beyond calling a halt to a certain relation to narrative, which is to look for its content. We don't look for its content. What is he doing? My question is, where is Auf? Where is On? How do you get there? What can you do there? Auf der Galerie. What's one thing you can do from the gallery, from the balcony, is you can see the ring. You can not only see what's going on in the ring, but you can see the ring itself, which you can't see from close up. You have a kind of a sighting that is from far, you do what Kafka called earlier the Tachtung. You can do a kind of consideration. You can find the position from which a kind of attentive consideration might reveal the truth of the situation. All that is possible out there gallery, but not in the orchestra seats, and not on the stage, and not backstage. Only on the balcony. We would say in the balcony in English, but really the what's at stake here is on. One thing you see from the gallery is what the ring enables is a kind of circling movement. 
right? It's just a simple observation. It has very little to do with the narrative, with the sequence of events. The Kunstreiter then goes around and around. If you look at that from a slightly more complex view, you can see that she's moving in a set of relations, <coughs> we call them. And if you look at this, these long sentences, they're really articulated by a set of prepositions. And the first one, in, on, in front of, in, on, under. One thing you might resort to in reading Kafka is making lists. <laughs> in the second part, in, on, in front of, in, on top of, under. These are sets of relations that she's moving through. If you focus on the suffering of the artist or the suffering of the director, you miss this issue. The Kunstreiterin, the art, art writer, the artistic writer, inhabits each of these relationships, and they have relations among one another on the stage. It's like a complicated celestial set of celestial bodies that are moving around on the stage. They look like spatial relationships, but really they're relationships of what I would call balance and counterbalance. A little here, a little there, a little support. The only place you can schematize this scenario, the balances of counter and balance, is from on the gallery. You get a certain optic from there that you would not get from in the action. Why do we look from the gallery and insist on reconstructing what happens in the action? what Kafka might be offering to us is a position from which we can let go of the action and see the relationships that are moving there. What you can do from the galleries, I'm calling schema, to schematize, right? Not to experience, but to schematize. Where is on? On and on, there's at least two different issues here. You could be on the stage or on the gallery. Let's say these are the two positions. On the gallery, you're tempted to schematize as if you were on the stage, but that's exactly what you can't do, right? Certainly on the stage, you can't schematize as if you were on the gallery. This kind of theater might be something about the relationship between these two arms. One thing is clear is that um, Kafka sees them as very different, though they occupy the same word. For example, if you see a river from on the river, you're tempted to say a river is moving or you're swimming in one way and the river is pushing you in another. There's a series of currents going there. You're between two banks. You're drowning. It's easy to drown on the river. It's not easy to drown on the gallery. Or a river from on the mountain is schematized as, as winding through the landscape. These are not the same river, according to Kafka. River is not river in this case. There's being in the river and there's being on the mountain. Our story is not about rivers, but about riders. And the question is, how does the rider stay up? I think this is the main question of the story. It's not about the narrative, but about the balance and the counterbalance, the positions and the counterpositions, the things that keep her from falling off. It leads you to ask, what exactly is the art that allows a rider to stand up on a horse? We all want to know this in any case, right? So we add on the balcony to on the balcony, we add on the horse, which is an important other on here. It's not like being in the river, but somehow riding along the top of it. As Vivian said, I think really insightfully, and the reading is, is much more complete than mine. So I, and only add mine as a kind of addendum to yours. That you can do two things on the balcony. One is you can imagine what's going on on the stage as though you were there, as though you could intervene. And the other one is you can judge. It must be like this. You can say, if it was like this, I could do this. Or you can say, it is like this. But both of those are really of the same flavor. You're imagining yourself, maybe even empathetically, intervening in the action, and you can say categorically what the action is. But the story is not about the struggle between an imaginative relationship to art and a realistic relationship to art, it seems to me. In both cases, when you're on the balcony, 
you try to decide what it means to be on the horse. That's what I think is going on. It's a question of what on means. Now it seems like from on the balcony you're standing on a kind of solid ground. You're standing at a distance, you're standing over it. You can actually see in a way that the director can't see what on means from the top. You can see the, the point of balance there. The director sees from the bottom up and sees only maybe uh, precarity. But the story presents us with a lot of seductions. One seduction is to think the artist can be a great artist because she suffers a lot. This we know is a kind of a joke, but uh, it relates very closely to Nietzsche's idea of art. Not that you suffer a lot, but that you have a very strong inner power that allows you to be an artist. That's Nietzsche's view. That the artist's inner power is expressed as art, but the art is only as good as um, being a reflection of the artist's inner power or will. The other view is that the, um, the artist has a kind of a grace and can get up there and just is a very graceful person. She does not suffering at all in the second half of the story. But these are, again, two sides of the same coin. Both of them have to do with um, how the artist is made psychologically, what the inner motivations are of the artist, his Kunstweiterungs, drives, her psychology. And it looks like the story is an investigation into the motivation of the writer in the first part, and the motivation of the director in the second part. But neither of these can be schematized from on the balcony. The test for you as a reader is to step back from motivations. That's really what, what, what allows, what the, the gallery gives you the freedom to ignore motivations. OK, I'm going to come to an end very soon, though not to the end. The question is, where is on? And I'm going to make a couple of proposals about it. On is ambiguous in a couple of ways. Auf, in this case, means on top of, atop, upon, resting on. This is an <coughs> investigation into what you could call Aufigkeit, or onish. <laughs> what, what is the quality of being upon? That's the issue here. Um, is it that the um, that the standard gets a certain statue status from being on something? Or is it that the thing that holds the, sta the standard up gives it a certain on quality? To which does the on belong? To the standard or to the platform? This is, a, this is the issue. The on is obviously the articulation point of the ground and the thing that stands on it. You could say, she is on. X, that means the artist on the horse, the artist is the artist, and the horse is not the artist. Or you could say, she's on the horse, and you have to say, ah, oh, the horse is the artist. Nobody thinks that in this story, the horse is, which is not mentioned at all, is obviously the artist who supports the, oh. let's say, what is on, the supported or the support? This is the main question. This is the question that only arises after gathering. You would never think of this if you were down there. You'd worried about her, her well-being. Or you drive the, drive the horse on. You'll notice that the story ends with two ons. The spectator from the gallery rests his head on the rail. And the artistic rider, when she steps off, she does this very funny thing where she goes onto her tiptoes. Remember this? I think it's the clue that the onishness is in question. But again, you have two, two ons here. The spectator who has um, considered but forgotten his onishness, has considered the scene but forgotten that it's about being on, weeps. The artist practices an even higher form, higher art of onishness, on her toes. 
what is it that allows you to stand on your toes? This is the question. <clears throat> is it your toes? Or is it the ground under you? It becomes completely ambiguous. I'm going to read a uh, very uh, mysterious phrase from Kafka that he wrote in the same year. Das Glück begreifen, dass der Boden, auf dem du stehst, nicht größer sein kann, als die zwei Füße in the dead. The luck to realize that the ground that you stand on can't be any bigger than the two feet that cover it. He was wondering where the um, ability, the special ability, which Nietzsche would say comes from the artist, to stand on your tippy toes, comes from. If you go back and look at the prepositions, the circling of the story and the circling of the writer, you can imagine that the tippy toes is simply an expression of all of the relations that need to come about for a circus performance to happen. And you see this much more clearly. I think I'm with you that the second, or I'm with one version of you, the version before you canceled it, that the second is the more insightful telling of the story. Why is that? Because it includes all the other people on the stage, the people who pull back the curtains, the people who hold the hoop for the, right? What is it that allows her to stand on the horse? It's all those people. It's the stage. It's the horse. It's the people who move it out of the way, move the curtains out of the way. What does that mean? That um, art is only the coordination of a set of accidents, you could put it that way, or different elements that are leading on one another in a particular way to allow this to occur. Had he not been so interested in the inner motivations of the characters, I'm convinced this is what the visitor on the balcony would have seen. <coughs> I think your reading is all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because you're staying up on the gallery. I'm up on the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very strong sense of what on means. Yeah. On means being on top. On top of the high horse. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm crediting the horse with the height. The rider is climbing. The rider right on there is a climb. <coughs> the rider is standing there like this. Yes. And what is this? This is the appreciation for all of the support she has. She this wants to spread her yeah. luck and happiness to everyone in the cast. And with her head leaned back and her arms stretched out. That the perfect <coughs> moment of poise. Um, her poise? Yes. This is suffering Christ. Let's see. <coughs> suffering creature who in the second part, just like Christ, has this redemptive where suffering is being not stopped by somebody who runs down through a revolution, but is embellished into a, a you know, redemptive myth. That's the role that the tippy toes play in the second part of the story. What's the role? The role is that uh, the suffering of the first part, rather than running down and intervening mm -hmm. and saying halt, mm -hmm. in that revolutionary gesture, mm -hmm. instead of that, it's being embellished that suffering is beautiful and suffering redeems us all, like this Christ figure in the second part. Because the second part, did you notice that you said that you are with me precisely where I am not? <laughs> you said you're with me in the second part of the story, but I presented the second part of the story as the illusion that is being painted over the image of terrible reality because, because this is the but in all the quotes that I had, in okay. the Kafka quote. But, 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 <laughs> you can't have it both ways. You're you're saying that the story is about the illusion. And the illusion comes up in the second half. Not about the suffering. If it was about the suffering, you would have just written the first half. 
But the story is about the illusion and how, as your, your reading is, how the reader, your allegory of reading, how the reader places the scene there and places whatever sorts of pleasures the reader needs to avoid, in this case, the suffering. Yes. Your reading is to undo that. But without the veil, there is no secret. So I think I'm right that the second half is key. But even if I'm not, um, how do you explain, this is what we do, so you have to excuse us. I feel like a little shy about really um, lighting into Vivian here in front of everybody. But Don't be shy. Go ahead. This is that. very patronizing when you say <laughs> decline it. Ich will der Kleine nichts antun. Go ahead. <laughs> No, Just there. That's, that's such a misreading, Vivian. Klein, the highest praise that Kafka has for anything ever is Klein. <laughs> and Kelly, yes. Um, sorry to interrupt <laughs> this family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would, I would to share my intuition about the text. It's the first time I read it, uh, and I very um, moved and impressed by your interpretations. But my intuition is that the node, the, the um, generative nucleus that unravels this whole story is the little little phrase that is your is. This is where it all starts. And the then is a, 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 a rhetorical attempt to uh, stand to, to stand against to try to sh to to change the this the, I, I, the English is that this is so I don't like the translation by the way I have several uh, critiques of it but but this is the place where the deepest uh, feeling yeah. of the story is is concentrated and then everything else is the um, the, the, the narrative um, deliberation, um, negotiation of that. And it leads me to thinking of uh, things about theory of theater and, and anti Aristotelian, etc. But I think this is not the moment to talk about mm -hmm. it, maybe later. So. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that is the, that's a kind of turning point. But it's, a, it's an absurd thing to say. It's certainly in a circus. And given how rarely Kafka gave titles to his pieces, how rarely, how rarely he gave titles, <coughs> I think the title is really key here. And from that position, it's very hard to make categorical judgments like that. So my intuition would be yes, but it can't be so that that is so. I completely agree with you. Oh <laughs> Can we stop here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I just want to reply and then uh, I'd like to hear your question. Uh, it is repeated twice. And you know how I read it? I read it as in the first part, he sees that world, and then he says, oh, well, that's, as, that's as so is, and twice. Uh, there is a kind of rhetorical insistence to say in a literary fictional story, does etwas so ist, and to say it with this insistence is a marker that it can't be so. I'm sorry for agreeing, but so you see, you I see, couldn't you help it this time. Vivian, you don't read it in the second instance, in the, in the last sentence, as resignation? Um, yes, but. That's what it is. To me, not an insistence, it's resignation. But that would be the resignation that the world is like in the first paragraph, not in the second. No, but I think it really matters who's speaking and from what position on the issue that um, you're conceding a kind of knowledge. He's basing his judgment on a kind of knowledge he can't have. Well, thank you. First of all, as long as I listened to you and you were not interrupted, I was so much with you. I thought, mm -hmm. well, it's brilliant. There was nothing to be left to be said. <laughs> and once you stopped, I thought, no, this is all uh, to be discussed and maybe totally different. <laughs> now, several questions <laughs> which came up, because I, I think it was wonderful exactly for raising questions. So 
uh, of course, the first uh, reading was a kind of, I would say, totally striking reading, because uh, I rem remember I read that for the first time in school, and of course I was identi identifying with the young uh, revolutional hero. Uh, now I would maybe read it rather along the lines of the young comrade of the measures taken by Brecht. Uh, so a naive intervention which doesn't change anything at all because it's just not uh, helpful. So what happens if he says, I, we don't know, in the end you could tell, well, there is a, there is a, a young uh, naive guy uh, on the gallery who thinks that a circus will stop because he cries height. Um, on the other hand, um, why do we uh, assume that weeping in the circus is negative? Uh, is it not perhaps because he's so touched by what he saw, this kind of art, right? So could we maybe turn it all the way around and say, well, this is what happens. This is how nice the world is. You weep without even knowing it. So you're deeply touched. And this is not because uh, the revolution does not take place, but rather because this is the revolution. There now. Okay, this was along the lines of your reading, because you turned it into some Nietzschean praise of the artist. However, as a theatre studies scholar, I have to say, the Kunstfertige Reiterin is the opposite of the artist, because the circus always was apart from the theatre. The theatre is the art, and there's the circus. It's the popular performance, which uh, you dismiss in the, in the middle of the 18th century in order to, to turn theatre into this kind of enlightenment uh, arena where uh, it's no longer a circus, but something very serious, um, enlightenment to happen. And it's of course interesting that the English translation omits totally the art. Huh? So the Kunstreiter becomes a writer. Um, and the Kunstfertigkeit, of course, is also not, it's not art, but it's rather crafts. It's, it's the opposite of art. So it's, it's to know to do something, it's nice if somebody knows what he does, but it's not the art. Um, but the question is then rather, would, would it not be rather about spectacle than about art? And spectacle as being, in a way, the opposite of the art. And then, of course, with Zeland, we would have to say that there is no opposite of spectacle to the art, because the art always already in, inherently also is the spectacle. And we can maybe only interrupt the spectacle by something that, uh, that with Zeland we would, would call poetry. Yes. So that was maybe not a question, but a, <laughs> But, but now the last thing, and this would be my question. <laughs> I think there is one other omission <coughs> in the translation which we should uh, take uh, account of. Uh, because we all, I think, in the first place, misread this. Kafka writes, wenn irgendeine hinfällige, lungensüchtige Kunstreiterin. Now he doesn't say schwindsüchtig, which would be tubercular. So tu tubercular would be schwindsüchtig. But she is lungensüchtig. So she's land, uh, uh, she is land addict, literally. Doesn't exist in German or, nor in English. Land, lungensüchtig, what does that mean? She wants to breathe. Huh? And the whole text is about breathing. That's the topic of the text. It's all about air. Huh? Give us more air. This is the text. It's not about space. It's not about, uh, not about revolution. It's about air. <laughs> Now what do you do with that? that? <laughs> yes, anyway, we will have to end soon, but uh, I think it is very appropriate that it is the spectator who has the last word here. So, Galili, please. Thank you both for very bright reading, and I agree, it stands in the stories. There's attention to both readings. You know, I, I just, if I got you correctly, first video, you argue about the story telling about the condition of perhaps the misconditioned of the possibility of intervention, of intervention in the revolutionary or even in the political sense of the word. And there's a word halt, creates kind of stop that makes possibility to reveal, uh, let's say, the false understanding of human, of human state, the condition of the gender, and even of the creature. It's also about the end. But then I thought perhaps you went too far in that model that is an hermeneutic, right? It's uh, you're really reveal something that cover that does Kafka cover. Mm -hmm. And actually it is not like that. One one would say it's not Kafkaesque enough because you know it is 
without a moral, on a moral. <coughs> Not in, in creating an indifference way of dealing with things, but there is another inversion there. And, and that's where I, I meet you already. Again, it's, 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 it's right indeed about proportions, perhaps uh, structure, and sending the honest and proportion, and then there's a measure of archetype. So but you write for. But you know, Hal is not only <coughs> Hal uh, is also a movement. It's created movement. It's a gesture. And therefore, you can see how it influences you know, the very idea, it creates a rhythm of the second <coughs> order. So it doesn't stop there. It creates, and you argue about that. And look, there is another a different rhythm. So for us, you can also appreciate a more kind of a dynamic reading. It doesn't stop on moral <coughs> or on structure, but understand, again, hurdling. In what sense, Cesura makes also a certain movement, and therefore, you know, create possibilities which are not there. You feel well, me? Right. Thank you, because this is precisely what we have done together. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think we're done.